angiogram of an obstructed azimuth vein. You can see how there's many, many, many collaterals that are trying to get blood back to the heart, pass that obstruction. The way I describe collaterals to people, you can imagine a highway. The normal azagus would be a highway. If there's an accident on the highway, everybody starts pouring out of the side streets trying to find a way back home on these side streets. That's what collaterals are like. In this patient, we angioplasty them multiple times, attempting to get that to stay open by itself. We watched them as they inspired and expired to make sure that this wasn't a red herring. We looked at the drainage going into the azagus vein, making sure that it was a significant source of drainage. And after con uh, consulting with the patient, um, we decided to put a stent in this vessel, and it restored a very robust flow. Go ahead, Michelle. This is the red herring I was talking to you about. On the left side, you'll see the azagus vein, and it looks like it's narrow. And we have seen stents put in there, but we don't want to see stents put in there because when the patient breathes in an opposite direction, this was um, inspiration on the left, actually expiration on the right, you can see how the azagus plumps right up. So here's a good example of a place where we definitely wouldn't want to use a stent. Okay? Go ahead, Michelle. Someone in this crowd is probably going to recognize this picture. Um, this is an azagus vein at the top on the left side. And where you see the one branch coming off on the right, that's the hemiazygous vein. And that hemiazygous vein was compressed by the aorta. The real question is, is it pertinent? Is it important? Because we just don't stent something just because it's blocked. That's not the way to go about it. In this person, we can see that there was a significant amount of flow from her spinal area and from, more superiorly, coming into this hemiazygous vein. It was just the way she was built. We're not all built the same. That's the way she was built, right? Right. Um, after multiple angioplasties, um, it wouldn't stay open, so we used the stem. And now the flow is, is fantastic, and you don't see that collateral either. And I would also ask you to look at this picture on the right. People who say, well, you know, stents weren't designed for veins, okay? Basically, most stents are very similar to the ones that we use, and you can see how this stent adopts to that venous structure very well. Go ahead, Michelle. Unfortunately, in our practice, one of the most common use of stents is for people who have received stents previously. This is um, a catheter in the right internal jugular vein. You can see the arrows pointing to that catheter in the left picture. This patient had a small stent, it was about 8 millimeters in diameter, put in their left internal jugular vein. This is an unfortunate thing. In our veins, it's all about flow. Thrombus just doesn't fall from the sky, it's not magic. It's like a stream. If you block up the stream, you start to form scum. It's the same idea. If you, if you decrease the flow in a vein, that's when thrombus starts to form. In this patient, they had a small stent that certainly didn't help the flow, and eventually they caught it off their right internal jugular vein. On the right side was partway through the process of cleaning out all the blood clot and trying to remove as much scar as we could. The unfortunate part with these small stents is that um, quite often we have to fracture open these small stents, and we have to put a larger stent within that small stent to tack it down to the wall. Um, this is one of the times we have to use a stent. Michelle. And this is the same patient after a, a larger stent, I think in this case it was about a 14 or 16 millimeter diameter stent, was put in that blood vessel. It's not perfect, don't get, don't get me wrong. I would like to avoid putting a stent in these people, but uh, sometimes we have to make difficult choices. Go ahead, Michelle. This is another example of a difficult situation. This is a patient who had a, a 6 millimeter diameter stent put in their azagus vein. And by way of comparison, you know, a typical size balloon for an azagus vein to angioplasty, it might be anywhere from 7, maybe up to even 12 millimeters in diameter every once in a while. A 6 millimeter diameter stent is obviously insufficient. And I think this is where a lot of the bad reputation of stents comes from. You know, obviously if someone gets a 6 millimeter diameter stent in a vessel that is 10 millimeters in diameter, they're going to have problems. Go ahead, Michelle. So, this wouldn't stay open with angioplasty. We had to fracture open that small stent and place a much bigger stent 
to try and ensure a good flow diameter, a large flow volume, to try and um, recover the flow of this azagous vein. And it's okay. Um, going from one to the next, you notice that all of those collateral vessels had gone away. And that's good, that's what we like to see. The flow has returned to its native azagous vein. So now we're going to get a little crazy. Is everyone ready to get a little crazy? Okay. Um, this is a skull, I'm sure most of you could tell that. Going up inside of the head, we have our jugular vein, which goes to the sigmoid sinus, which leads to the transverse sinus, and that catheter is all the way up inside the sagittal sinus. The reason we're up inside this patient's head like that is because, um, based on a previous study, and based on um, the evidence we had from our diagnostic imaging, we suspected that this patient had an inflow abnormality into the jugular vein. They had a, a left internal jugular vein that failed treatment, okay? And one of the important things about treatment is that it's not just about a stenosis. It's about the flow into the vessel and the flow out of the vessel along with the stenosis. So you can treat the stenosis and make it look pretty, but if you don't have flow, again, flow, I'm gonna say that about a million times here today so you understand. If you don't have the flow into the vessel, it doesn't matter, it might not stay open. So this person failed the left internal jugular vein angioplasty, and we suspected that they had an inflow abnormality. In fact, we suspected that it was somewhere in the transverse or sigmoid sinus. So in order to prove this, we went up inside the source of the flow, and we should see contrast coming down both sides. We only see it coming down one side, and that tells us that the flow into that other side is not yeah. good. Yeah. Go ahead, Michelle. Okay, that's okay. So then we went into that affected side, and we injected contrast. The picture on the left side, the blood is flowing all the way around to the other side. It should be coming down around that catheter, but it's not. Right at the tip of that catheter is a blockage. So we pulled our catheter back just a little bit, and we tried to force some contrast through it. And you can see that a lot of that contrast hits that blockage, it's a narrowing, and comes back. I'll point to the narrowing for you. It's right here. So the contrast is coming up, it's hitting the narrowing, and a lot of it's just coming back down because it can't get through there. And likewise, blood that would be coming down here can't get through there. So then the question is, you know, the body's full of all sorts of mysterious things. The question is, does it matter, and should we try and fix it? We put a, an IVIS catheter up there, which is intravascular ultrasound, and we saw the same problem. We put a flow wire up there, and we determined that there was, in fact, a significant pressure gradient across that area of stenosis. Putting these factors together, along with the, uh, an otherwise great-looking left jugular vein, where the only problem seemed to be a problem with inflow, we decided that we'd try and treat this. So we tried to angioplasty it multiple times, and that didn't work. Go ahead, Michelle. On the left side, you can see, it's hard to see, actually. We actually went up inside another vein in the middle of the brain called the straight sinus, and we're about to deploy a stent. After we deploy the stent, the narrowing's gone, and blood is flowing freely across that area of stenosis. Again. I don't want you to get the impression that we stent everything we see, but I'm here to show you some applications of where stenting may be considered. And in this patient, after a very deliberate consideration, and looking at all the etiologies of her problem, we felt that it's something that should be considered. Okay, Michelle. Restenosis, it's a problem. Um, you know, we all worry about it, it's in the news a lot. It's probably one of our biggest concerns in our practice. Um, some angioplasties and stents will restenose. There's no doubt about it. Okay. There is no good data regarding the rates of restenosis in the setting of CCSVI. Some small studies have suggested restenosis rates in the neighborhood of 50 percent. We can look to dialysis patients. Dialysis patients get a lot of venous angioplasties, and they get a lot of stenting done. Stenting done in these patients shows a primary patency from approximately 20 to 60 percent. Primary patency means from the moment that stent is put in until it fails, if ever. Secondary patency 
is if that person requires a re-intervention, how long will it stay open? In many studies, the secondary patency ranges from approximately 60 to 100 percent at one year. So basically, they've had an intervention. There are also some studies in these patients that show secondary patency of from 20 to 80 percent at two to four years. So really, what I'd like you to take away from this is that, number one, it's not an ideal process. Restenosis is a reality, OK? And number two is that we just need to study it more before we can really fully understand it. I think more than anything, um, restenosis really needs us to evaluate for the judicious angioplasty and placement of stents in patients who have CCSVI. As I've discussed with you, um, central venous stenosis treatment, both angioplasty and stenting, is widely adopted in many other um, disease processes other than CCSVI. Societies such as the Interventional Radiology Society has guidelines for doing it. This is not, uh, you know, angioplasty and stent in these vessels is not something we just came up with a year and a half ago. It's been around for a long time. And again, but I want you to keep in mind there's no conclusive benefit to stenting. I, I get some people who call me and talk to me on the phone. And they say, well, I, I failed my angioplasty. I want to stent. It's not that simple, okay? There's a, many more factors to it besides that. Go ahead, Michelle. In our practice, um, stenting is certainly not the primary option. We end up stenting approximately 3 to 5% of our patients. Most of those are patients who are coming to us with previously placed stents. In the future, you've probably read or heard about some other um, hopes for venous stenting. There, are, um, there is talk of vein-specific stents. There is, uh, a, you know, I'm not going to deny the fact that it may be possible to design a stent that addresses some of the pathophysiological and biomechanical aspects of a vein that could improve patency levels, so we can hope for that. There are also bioabsorbable stents that are coming along. Most of these have been tested in the heart. Um, their efficacy in terms of restenosis in some recent trials lies somewhere between normal metal stents and drug-eluting stents. The problem with them at this point is they don't have very much radial strength. They don't have the ability to keep the vessels open. And in central venous stenoses, there tends to be a significant amount of resistance. So radial strength will be very important. Go ahead, Michelle. Some closing thoughts. Stents are suitable for treatment of central venous stenosis, but they should be a last resort. Reinterventions, as well as treatment in the hemiazygous and azygous veins, are places where we do consider placing stents. When you talk to your physician, whoever ends up treating you, if you do end up getting treated, and you should discuss the placement of stents with them if they do it, when they consider it, how they would do it. Ask them everything you can about them. Whatever you've learned from this talk, I would take some of that information and talk to them about it. Go ahead, Michelle. Here's a cartoon that I thought was kind of funny. It sort of addresses some of the concerns. It says, there's a football player on the field and there's his trainer next to him and he says, okay, you're all set. That stent in your artery will, will get you through the second half, but I'll need to open you back up after the game. <laughs> sort of tongue in cheek. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, some of you know us. Um, it's nice to put a face to a name. There's Dr. Rada, he's right in the middle, the guy with a big smile on his face. Um, there's Dr. Grable and Dr. Harris. Go ahead, Michelle. I've heard that a few of you use Facebook. Is that correct? <laughs> Just a couple. Yeah. So if you, uh, we put a lot of things on our, our website, um, updates, treatments that we've done, things that you might find of interest. So if you'd like to go, we do have Facebook and we have something called Twitter too that I'm not too familiar with. You can try that out if you like. That's all I have in terms of that talk. Thank you.